Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church here at online at Church in the Marketplace. Uh, and happy Mother's Day, whether you're uh, celebrating with your mum, uh, whether you are a mum, whether you're a mum to be, however you're celebrating, then uh, then we're glad that we can share a little part of today with you. Uh, for just a minute, we're going to watch a little video clip. It's uh, a, a bunch of guys from the States called the Skit Guys, and they, uh, they've just got a little clip about Mother's Day, so please enjoy it as you watch this. Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. <sighs> Mommy needs a quarantine. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. And even though they love their kids to the moon and back, Mommy, where are you going? sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy! You know, to recharge. Go talk to Daddy. Mommy! Where are you? But no matter what's happening in the world, their favorite way to spend time is with their family. In good times, in hard times. Mom! Hi. You're breaking everything! In uncertain times. Thank you, Mom, for making time for us every single day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I ask that you would watch over us as we go to bed and rest, that you would speak to us in Bible stories and speak to us in... Mother's Day can bring a mix of emotions for many women. There are those anticipating the birth of their first child. There, there are stepmums wondering what their place is. Um, there are those in family life, there are those who've lost their mother and, and face today grieving on Mother's Day. There are mums who feel, have feelings of hurt because their children have turned from God. There are those who are overwhelmed with pain because they've lost their child. Uh, no matter what you face this Mother's Day, we, uh, we, we pray that God will still hold you in his love and care and, and as you celebrate, as you remember, as you grieve, however you come to this Mother's Day, uh, we want to know that we're thinking of you and praying for you as well. A little later on in our service, we're going to uh, meet one of our mums and one of our mums-to-be. And at that time, we'll take a moment to pray for mums as well. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God. Thank you that it's Mother's Day. Lord, we thank you for our mums. Lord, we also just thank you for today. And Lord, we thank you that we can just come and worship you freely. We thank you for this country, Lord, that we can just freely express our faith. And Lord, we thank you that we can still meet together, even though it's online. Lord, I thank you that it's just going to be faith building. And yeah, we just, we just worship you right here this morning. And we just praise you and we give you all the glory and the honor. And Lord, I just thank you that you would fill every heart with joy and that we would just have the joy of the Lord as our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes the light grows dim And we can't see you or feel you But you're right there in the mystery You're right there in the reflection of the sea You're calling out to me You're the beginning and the end You're my father and my friend Your grace and mercy cover me You turn the darkness 
into life. You're the God of power and might. You have done it all. Sometimes we cannot see the kaleidoscope of your plan. But as we place our trust in you, you work all things together for our good. You're making a way. You're the beginning and the end. You're my father and my friend. Your grace and mercy cover me. You turn the darkness into light. You're the God of power and might. You have done it all. You're the beginning and the end. You're my father and my friend. The grace and mercy cover me. You turn the darkness into light. You're the God of power and might. You have done it all. Your ways are higher. Your love is deeper than anything I know. You're always faithful to your promise. Draw near to you. Your love is deeper, your ways are higher than anything I know. You're always faithful to your promise as we draw near to you. darkness into light. You're the God of power and might. You have done it all. You're the beginning and the end. You're my father and my friend. Your grace and mercy cover me. You turn the darkness into light. You're the God of power and might. You have done it all. Well, welcome to Church in the Marketplace online. It's so great to be with you this morning. We just want to say happy Mother's Day again. And you know, we don't have real flowers to give you, but we have these flowers. Happy Mother's Day. And as always, we're going to take a moment just to say good day in the chat. Uh, welcome. One of the things we said we'd do on, on coming Sundays is introduce some of the Church in the Marketplace staff and, and, and ask them a little bit about what they do and, and what that means for them. And also it's Mother's Day, so we've been trying to link with uh, some of our mums or mums-to-be. So uh, this Sunday I want to introduce to you Raina. Uh, <laughs> Raina, Raina works in our church office and, and 
part of her responsibility is looking after all our graphics and Facebook and all that sort of technology. And, uh, and she's a mum-to-be, a first-time mum-to-be. And so we thought we'd uh, just ask her a few questions about all of that. So uh, Raina, tell us a little bit about the work that you do here. Um, well, right now I um, am more behind the camera, <laughs> helping out this service. So um, generally I work in reception and I do all the graphics and just anything that needs to be done. Last week Brody told us that, that the, part of the big news for him was that uh, he's going to be a first time dad and uh, you're the other part of that story, you're the first time mum, so uh, tell us a little bit about about uh, your hopes and dreams about being a mum. Um, I hope that I can cope. <laughs> um, mostly my dreams and hopes are that she will love God and that is my biggest dream for her and I just hope that I can teach her that so I need God. <laughs> So tell us a bit about, um, because obviously you and a number of people who are expecting their first baby are doing that in this, this environment of the COVID-19 pandemic. So tell us some of the, the, uh, some of the things that means for you, some of the concerns that you have because of, because of that. Well, um, a lot of the things that most first time um, mums would expect would you have a baby shower you'd be able to go out into the world and show off your growing bump um, you know have all these things you can do that you look forward to which kind of I can't look forward to now all I can share this growing bump with is I share it with Brody and the cats um, and looks like we won't be having a proper baby shower um, there's a lot more worry at hospitals. Um, Brody wasn't allowed to come in to a midwife appointment. So just everything's changed a bit, but people have been having babies for a long time, so, and during pandemics, so I think I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a baby shower over Zoom doesn't quite work the same way, does it? Um, so, so if we as the church community uh, are praying for you and Brody and, and, and the baby to come, um, what's one thing in particular that we can be praying for you guys? Um, just pray for our mental health. <laughs> that because we can't get the immediate support of family and you, you won't be able to have people just come and drop by and visit and maybe bring a lasagna. Just pray that we're going to be able to cope and just pray that we're all healthy. Mm -hmm. So how about we do that? Lord, uh, thank you for Brody and for Raina. Thank you for their ministry here at Church in the Marketplace. Uh, thank you for the baby and the, and, and the new family that they will become. And Lord, uh, we do want to pray with them because we know that this is a particularly difficult time and and. and and there are many kind of anxieties and, and facing situations in new and different ways. And we would love them to know in as concrete a way as possible that, that our love surrounds them and that our prayers uphold them. And so, Lord, we do pray that, that you would protect them and you would bless them as, as the time for the baby arrives. But uh, thank you for them and we pray that you would hold them in your grace and in your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to introduce to you Claudia. Hi Claudia. Hi everybody. And uh, Claudia is responsible for our playgroup. So Claudia, tell us a bit about playgroup and what it does here at Church in the Marketplace. Well, playgroup's really interesting. We have such a variety of nationalities and people and family dimensions. And there's a basically zero to two and we play lots of games and we do make lots of mess and um, yeah, it's fun. And we have up to 33 families sometimes and sometimes down to five. So it's quite varied. So uh, what drew you to that ministry at Church in the Marketplace? Well, actually, the job was offered to me on a silver platter and I couldn't say no. <laughs> no, but I really love children. I'm an old paediatric nurse and I just, just love that age group. I love toddlers. Why? I don't know, but they're fun. So, yeah, so I just thought, you know, it was something that it was employment. I thought, wow, why not? Well, give it a go and see what happens. And I've been here for a while and I still love it. 
and uh, how, do, how do you see God connecting into that ministry or how does that ministry help connect people with God in some way? Well, so, uh, we often try and do little stories or do craft about little Bible stories stories that aren't too invasive because a lot of these children have no idea what church and who Jesus is so we need to step in quite gently into that whole sort of um, situation. Often I think it's ministry to the parents as well because they're often uh, new here or visiting so I kind of try and give them my little pearls of wisdom um, and I pray with them so I ask them if they'd like a prayer and I just pray with them and they seem to respond mostly to that. Mm -hmm. So. Uh what, what's one thing that you really love about the ministry? I just love when the kids come in. I know, I know they can't hug me now, but they just are so funny. They just greet me as Auntie Claudia and they come in, they hug my legs or they want to be hugged. And I just think, wow, I really feel part of their little lives. So I think that's really special. You're a mum of two grown-up kids. Big kids. Tell, tell us, do, two big kids. So tell us a little bit about being a mum and what that experience is for you. Well, I kind of thought, here I am. Uh, I looked at what motherhood was and I thought it was such a beautiful meaning. So I thought I'll just read it to you. And it was someone who cares and nurtures her children with the deepest love she sees and the truest and the deepest in them. A mother is concerned if they are hurt or frightened and most of all, she cares about your dreams and success. And I thought, yeah, that's pretty well covers every age group because my children are big now. So they're at, in careers and studying again. Uh, they've moved out of home or well, one has, Anton has, who's 28 and Monica who's 25 and always wants to move out, but comes back quite quickly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think mothers, there's so many different stages. I think having somebody with a disability certainly teaches you more patience, um, but we call her our blessing from God. So she's taught us so much to be kinder and nicer people. So, you know, she's good. <laughs> so uh, tell us, I mean, what's one thing you love about being a mum? Um, I, think, I think just that personal interaction with them and praying with them. And even though Anton's in England now, we still pray via Skype or FaceTime. And, um, and he still appreciates that. So I think praying with them and just watching them grow um, and their funny little antics and I've written a little book of all the funny things they said as toddlers and young children and I sometimes read it back to them and we both have a little laugh so I think the laughter is definitely fun and I think just watching them grow and turning into hopefully responsible adults. <laughs> and what's, what's one of the struggles of being a mum? I think it's time management, I think it's like balancing you know doing all the things that you want to do, but sometimes not having the time to do it. Uh, I find that a bit hard, so I'm often up quite late or really early at the moment, <laughs> so just to do things, to make things special. Um, yeah, I think, I think time is one of the hard things. Um, and I think maybe, yeah, and just managing everything, trying to fit it all in and trying to be there for everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and into that picture of being a mum and all that entails, how, how does God fit into that picture for you? Oh, lots of prayers. <laughs> I think I think my my prayer was always uh, um, God guide me and give me wisdom while I'm doing this. Show me what I should be doing. How can I help Monica or how can I help Anton? And my prayers were always show me what to do now or how to do it. And it's amazing because they were always answered in some sort of interesting way. You know, I'd read something or some, a Bible verse would pop into my head and it would just go yeah that's good and I think my offered prayer was be still and know that I'm God I think I walked a lot on that mm -hmm. that one so um, but yeah I think praying with your children is so much fun and listening to their little prayers I think that was positive but making them you know be disciplined to do the prayers is harder mm -hmm. so uh, you talked about praying so can I invite you just to lead us in a prayer for sure. all mums on yep. this Mother's Day yeah, I wrote it out because otherwise I get nervous and then I I don't say what I want to say, so um, I'll just pray now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all mothers in the world. We pray for protection over them and give them your love and your uh, kindness and wisdom and strength and give them joy, but most of all, give them laughter. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, how great was that? What a treat to hear from some of our mums in the house. Um, I'm pretty excited. My wife's going to be a mum soon. I'm going to be a dad. Very exciting. Um, but we just want to encourage everyone with, with their giving. We just want to say again a massive thank you to everyone who's continuing to support Church in the Marketplace uh, financially. And as always, the link is in the description. So if you'd like to give, uh, you can click the link and you can do that there. Uh, the other things that are happening, we still have our Zoom groups. So there's still the one going on Thursday night and we've got one on Wednesday night. It's a really good group, the Wednesday night one. I run that one. <laughs> no, but we'd love to see you at, at those groups. So if you would like to join them, click on the links in the description. And also we've, we've still got our Minecraft going on Friday night. Today's reading will be from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 18. And I'll be reading from the NLT version. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then, on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God. Just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice. And I will share your joy. Well, morning everyone. It's good to be with you as we explore God's Word together this morning. Wherever in the world you're joining us from, we pray that God will bless you as you listen in with us this morning. So the story's told about a little boy who jumped into his father's lap and said, Daddy, my heart is so full of happiness. And then he jumped off and he went to, pray with his, to play with his brother and an hour later he came back with a long face and his dad said, What happened to your happy heart? And the boy said, Brian made it all leak out. Well, isn't that true? Sometimes our hearts spring a leak and it seems it can happen quite easily. We can be very happy one minute and, and the next minute because of a phone call or because of what somebody said to us or because somebody cut us off in the traffic, whatever, we can spring a heart leak. It's very, very easy to lose the happiness in our hearts. So today we're going to look at some tools to help us keep our hearts happy in spite of all the things that happen in our lives, all the things that cause us to spring a heart leak. We're looking at Philippians chapter 2. If you want to follow, it's verses 12 to 18. And there we see five of the most common ways that we lose our happiness. And Paul shows us some antidotes, some cures, some remedies to keep us from losing our happiness. Brody read it for us, Philippians 2, 12 to 18. The key part in this passage is verses 12 and 13 where it says, You must continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, with deep respect and humility. For it is God who works in you both to will and to act according to his good purpose. Did you notice work out and work in? In our lives, God has a part and we have a part in our spiritual growth. God's part is to work in, to work in us, to work in our salvation. And our part is to live it out, to work it out. What does it mean to work out our salvation? Notice it doesn't say to work for our salvation. There's a big difference. We can't work for our salvation. Paul doesn't say, work for our salvation, like work really hard and then we'll be saved. The Bible doesn't teach that. In, in fact, the Bible teaches the opposite. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, it's by God's grace 
that you're saved through faith. And even the faith is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. So no one could boast. If we could work our way to heaven, then every would, everyone would be bragging about who got there and how they got there. So, so we can't work for our salvation. Paul doesn't say that. He says we're to work out what God first works in. God works in the salvation and we work it out. When, when we work out a puzzle, did, did we create the puzzle? Well, no, it was already created. What's the working out part of the puzzle? When, when we're putting all the pieces together and then we can say, look at the big picture. This is the key, where to work out what God first works in. So now, how, how do we have a happy heart? In this passage, we have Paul's workout strategy, his workout plan, his five exercises for a happy heart. Now, let me, let me remind us, Philippians is a simple, straightforward book, but simple doesn't mean it's easy. These five exercises, they're pretty easy to understand, but they're not so easy to do. We know the right things that will make us physically healthy. Do we always do them? Well, no. And these are the things that will make us emotionally and spiritually happy, but we can hear them and still not do them. So as we prepare to think about them, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your promise, your commitment to work salvation into us. And we hear your claim, your call on our lives to work out that salvation in, in, the, in the things that we say and the things that we do in the world around us. We hear your call that we're to be like light and salt. We're, we're to be people who point to Jesus in the way that we live. And so, Lord, we, we pray, we thank you that, that you offer us joy and a happy heart when we fulfill those things that you call us to do. And, Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us and you would equip us to do the things that you call us to do so that one of the things people might see in us is a joy and a contentment and a happiness that comes from you and through you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first exercise to do with a happy heart really has to do with the emotion of fear. Fear is one of the primary reasons that we lose our happiness. We can't be afraid and be happy at the same time. We just can't. When we're afraid, fear comes in the front door, but happiness goes out the back door of our lives and the happiness stays gone until the fear goes. So we've got to get rid of fear in our lives. One of the biggest fears we have is the fear of being abandoned, the fear of being alone, the fear to feel like we're facing life all by ourselves. We've all felt that. We've all felt it at different times in our lives that we're alone and nobody's there to help us. So here's the first exercise. Paul says, remember that God is with us. He's in us and he is for us. This is the first verse that we have to deal with in Philippians. It's in verse 13. No matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going to face this next week, we are not going to face it alone. God is with us, he is in us, and he is for us. Philippians 2.13 says, For God is always working in you, giving you both a desire to obey him and the power to do what pleases him. God is always working. The word in Greek is the word energos, which, from which we get the word energy. God is the energy driver in our lives. We're not just going on our own power. God says, I'll give you the power and I am working in you. And no matter what you're facing, I am in you. And not only is God in us, he's also with us. John 14, 18 to 20 says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will be with you and you will realize that you are in me and I am in you. That's quite a promise. God says, not only am I with you, I'm in you. And not only am I in you, I'm around you. The Bible tells us 
in the book of Colossians that we're hidden with Christ in God. Think about that. The Bible says Christ is in me. The Bible says I'm in Christ. The Bible says we're hidden with Christ in God. And the Bible says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's pretty good protection. And that's a great fear reliever. And then not only is God with us and in us, the Bible says God is for us. Romans 8.31 says, if God is for us, who can defeat us? So in you and with you and for us. The first exercise, if we want to be happy, we, we need to start our days with God. Thank you that you're going to be with me today. You're going to be in me today and you're going to be for me today. How good is that? If God is with us and God is in us and God is for us, what in the world are we doing being anxious or discouraged? The second habit or exercise to maintain a healthy heart is this. Be grateful and never grumble. Uh-oh, now we get to verse 14. This deals with the second cause of the loss of our happiness, fretting and fighting over the small stuff. Do we ever do that? Yes, we do. We all do it. We fret and we fight over the small stuff. That's verse 14. And it's a hard habit to break because we can be negative by nature and we're conditioned by our culture. And ever since Adam and Eve, we've been going around excusing and accusing. We excuse ourselves for all the mistakes we make and we accuse everybody else for all their mistakes. We hide and we hurl, we blame others for the problems in our lives. We say, if I just had a different husband, then I'd be happy. If I'd just not married, then I'd be happy. If I just had children, then I'd be happy. If my children would leave home, I'd be happy. That's the when and then thinking. We're always blaming somebody or something else. And, and we've said it before, we, we can't blame anybody else. Happiness is a choice. We have to stop excusing and accusing and we have to stop fretting and fighting over the small stuff. Philippians 2, 14 and 15 says, Do everything without complaining or arguing so that no one can speak a word of blame against you. That, friends, must be one of the most difficult verses in the Bible. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that nobody can speak a word of blame against you. Here's some of the types of complainers we run into all of the time. First, there are the whiners. Have we got any whiners in our lives? There was a bumper sticker that said, I may rise, but I refuse to shine. That, that's what the whiner does. They wake up negative. And it's a choice. We, we can get up in the morning and we can say, good morning, Lord. Or we can get up in the morning and say, good Lord, it's morning. And that's a choice. The, the second habit of happiness, the second skill, the second exercise in the workout for a happy heart, we've got to learn to be grateful. Always grateful and never grumble. The, the second kind of complainers are martyrs. Their, their favourite expression is, nobody appreciates me. They throw pity parties. Everybody hates me. Nobody loves me. Think I'll go and eat worms. They're the martyrs. How do we react when we don't get our way? Do, do we pout? Do we mount a campaign of complaining? Do we continue to fuss and argue and complain and moan? There are whiners and there are martyrs. The third kind of complainer are the cynics. Their attitude is, what's the use? Why bother? Why try? It isn't going to make any difference. Cynics just poison everything. Then number four, there's the perfectionists. Nothing is ever good enough for these complainers. Nothing is quite the way that it ought to be. They're unpleasable. Their favourite phrase is, is that the best you can do? If you got a pass, the perfectionist wants you to get a credit. If you got credits, they want you to get a distinction. The Bible says if we want to be happy, we've got to be grateful and never grumble. 
do everything without complaining and arguing so no one can speak a word of blame against you. You know, I think the scariest verse in the Bible is Matthew 12, 36. It, it, something Jesus said, he said, I tell you this, that you will give an account on judgment day of every careless word you have spoken. That sends shivers up my spine. How many times have I complained and grumbled and argued about something when I shouldn't have been sweating the small stuff? Someone said, don't sweat the small stuff is law number one of life. And law number two is it's all small stuff. At least most of it is. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What's God's will for our lives? There it is. In everything give thanks. Really? Yes, that's God's will. And when we can do that, then God can show us what step B is. Notice the word in. It, it doesn't say for. It doesn't say for everything give thanks. It says in everything give thanks. There are a lot of things that we shouldn't be thankful for. I am not thankful for COVID-19. I am not thankful for war. I'm not thankful for leukemia or for cancer. I'm not thankful for people who get raped and molested. I'm not thankful for racial injustice. There's a lot of brokenness and evil in the world. To be thankful for evil is a perversion of what God teaches in his word. The Bible doesn't say be thankful for everything. It says we're to be thankful in everything. Why? Well, we can use it to draw closer to God. We can use it to draw closer to others. We can use it to grow more like Christ. We can use it as a ministry to serve others. We can use it as a platform for witness. We can be thankful in a situation because we know Romans 8.28 says, In all things God works for the good. Not everything is good, but in all things God works for good. So in everything we can give thanks because we know God can turn crucifixions into resurrections. He, he loves to change ashes into beauty. So in everything, give thanks. In other words, be grateful and never grumble. Do you think we'd be happier if we followed this second exercise every day, if we grumbled less and were more grateful? It's not rocket science. Study after study has shown Gratitude is the healthiest attitude psychologically. The third exercise to maintain a happy heart is this. Keep our conscience clear. That's verse 15. Because one of the things that causes us to lose our happiness is feeling guilty or ashamed. The Bible says if we want to be happy, we have to get rid of guilt. We can't be guilty and happy at the same time. So we've got to maintain a clear conscience. Philippians 2.15 says, You are to live clean and pure lives as children of God in a broken and corrupted generation. That was written more than 2,000 years ago. And generations are still broken and corrupted. Human nature doesn't change. Paul says you're to live clean and pure lives as children of God in a broken and corrupted generation, you were to shine like stars lighting up a dark world. What a beautiful image. What an incredible image that is. That we live such a clean life. We live such a life of integrity. We live a life of purity. We live with a clear conscience. We live with such authenticity. Our life is an open book in such a way when people look at us, they say... You're a star. It's like a jeweler will always put diamonds on black velvet. Why? Because they shine brighter against a black backdrop. And as the world around us and the culture we live in becomes darker, Christians are to shine brighter and brighter. Here's the same thing. Psalm 119 verses 1 and 2 says, Happy are those who live pure lives, who follow the Lord's teaching, 
keep his rules and try to obey him with their whole heart. Jesus said it like this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You, you know what the word blessed means. It's the word for happy in Greek. When Jesus gets up and he delivers the Beatitudes, blessed are you when you do this, blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure in spirit, blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's really like he's saying here are eight ways to be happy. He starts the greatest sermon ever with eight ways to be happy. And he says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. The happier our heart is, it's because it's a pure heart, it's a clean heart. And here in Psalm 32 verse 1 it says, What happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven. What joy when sins are covered. What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record. I reckon that's like the soap dish verse of the Bible. It cleans us. Notice happiness and joy and relief. They're three things that everybody's looking for in life. We all want to be happy. We all want to enjoy life and we all want relief from our pain. And the Bible says that comes in part from purity and purity comes from forgiveness from God's grace. What happiness, what joy, what relief for those, it says, who've confessed their sins and God has cleared their record. So here's a third exercise to maintain a happy heart. We have to keep a clear conscience. That means at the beginning and the end of every day, we do a spiritual inventory and we say, God, is there anything between us? We say, I'm not going to bed tonight with rubbish. I've got some garbage that I've picked up from bad attitudes, from bad reactions, things I've said and things I've done, and I'm not going to bed tonight with this sack of garbage and then get up in the morning and carry it off again. No, I'm going to deal with it. So we, we practice a kind of spiritual breathing. We breathe out our sins in confession and we breathe in God's power and cleansing. If we confess our sins, it says... He's faithful and he's just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, God's promised it. So we keep our consciences clear. How would our house smell if we took out the garbage only once a week? Pretty smelly, I guess. We usually have to take out the garbage every day. And we need to do that spiritually too. We need to take out the garbage every day. And if we do that, We'll have a happier heart. We, we make our confession to God every day and we get cleansing and we get forgiveness. The fourth exercise to maintaining a happy heart is remember God's word and live it. It's another important habit of happiness. When we're feeling depressed, it's often because we're thinking depressed thoughts. And if we want to get out of our, our depression, we, we change the way that we think. We get transformed, Paul says, by the renewing of our mind. How do we do that? How do we wash out the depressive thoughts in our mind? Well, there are lots of ways. Sometimes there's a chemical way. There's a medicinal way. Sometimes there's an emotional way. Sometimes there's a relational way. And sometimes there's a spiritual way. The Bible talks about the washing of the water of the word. If we choose to dwell on a worry, have you noticed that when we do that, it just gets bigger? It doesn't get smaller the more that we worry about something. The more we worry, it gets bigger and it gets bigger. And if we know how to worry, we already know how to meditate on the Word of God. Because worry is when we take a negative thought and we think on it over and over and over. That's called worry. When we take a passage of scripture and we think on it over and over and over, that's called meditation. And God has promised many wonderful benefits in our lives if we will meditate on the word of God and then do it. We're to hear it, we're to study it, we're to remember it. Philippians 2.16 says, Hold tightly to the word of life. 
Why should we do that? Psalm 119.16 says, Your principles make me happy, so I never forget your word. Do we want to be happy? Obviously we do. Principles, God's principles make us happy. How do we never forget God's principles? We need to remember them. Psalm 119.35 says, Lead me in the path of your commands, because that is where my happiness is found. Well, usually we're looking for happiness in all the wrong places. God says happiness is found in the path of his commands. The fifth exercise in Paul's workout for a happy heart is use our lives to serve God by serving others. If we're serious about happiness, and happiness is a serious subject, if we're serious about being happy, we need to use our lives to serve God by serving others. How do we serve God when we can't even see God? We serve God by serving others. Jesus said in Matthew 25, Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. He said, even if we give a cup of cold water in his name, he says, it's as if you did it to me. When we're polite to people, when we're nice to people, when we're friendly, when we're helpful, when we serve others, God says, it's like serving me. How does that bring happiness into our lives? Because God wired the universe so that happiness doesn't come from status. Happiness doesn't come from our salary. It doesn't come from our success. It comes from service. God wired the universe so that we're happiest when we're giving our lives away. Why? Because God wants us to become more like him. It's all about love. So the more we give our lives away, the more we serve others. And the more we serve God by serving others, the happier we're going to be. Mark 8.35 says, If you insist on saving your life for yourself, you will lose it. Only those who sacrificially give away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it really means. This is the fifth secret of a happy heart. We have to practice service and generosity every day. Jesus said it like this, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, I came to serve and I came to give. Those those are the two things that will bring more happiness into our lives than anything else. Those two words define what it means to follow Jesus. If we're not serving, if we're not giving, we're not following Jesus. Jesus wired the universe in such a way that the more we give ourselves away, the more God gives back to us, the more we're blessed and the happier we are. Philippians 2, 17 and 18 says, Your faith makes you offer your lives as a sacrifice in serving God. If I have to offer my own blood, remember Paul's in jail, he's getting ready for execution. If I have to offer my own blood as a sacrifice, I'll be happy and full of joy. And you should be happy and full of joy with me too. Do you see the word sacrifice in that verse? Our faith makes us offer our our lives as a sacrifice and, and to serve. Those two words, sacrifice and serving, are two of the keys to lifelong happiness. Generosity and service. Giving our lives and giving our resources. So let me ask us two questions. One, where do we serve others on a regular basis? Because it's an essential exercise for a happy heart. Uh, An article in the American Medical Journal and another one in Time magazine reported studies that show that serving other people, volunteering, actually extends our physical life. We will live longer if part of our lives we give away unselfishly, serving and sacrificing for others in some way. The other one was that serving is one of the quickest ways to pull us out of depression. It's obviously not the only way, but it's one way 
to pull us out of depression by getting our focus off ourselves and getting our focus on somebody else. God has wired the universe so that through sacrifice and through serving, our joy goes up and our sorrow goes down. So let me ask us another question. Is our heart growing more generous? Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. But you know what blessed means? Makarios, it's happy. There's more happiness in giving than in receiving. Jesus says our giving reveals the condition of our heart. He says where your treasure is, your heart will be. It's an attitude. It's an exercise that causes us to be happier. It's no accident that the word miserable comes from the word miser. And the, wo- and the more miserly we are, it's mine, it's mine, I'm going to keep it, I'm going to hold on tightly, the more miserable we are going to be. Now, before we begin these exercises, these five workouts that Paul gives us for more happiness in our hearts, we, we know that if we were going to do an exercise program, they always say the first thing we do is we need to check with our doctor about any pre-existing condition. Before attempting this, every diet book, every exercise book says check with your doctor about any pre-existing condition because you might have a heart problem. And spiritually, we all have a heart problem. We've got a coronary disease. The Bible's, the Bible's word for it is sin. That's why before we can do these exercises, we've got to have our heart healed. The Bible tells us that often our hearts are broken and bitter. The Bible tells us that our hearts are often sick and self-centered. The Bible says that our hearts are often deceptive and discouraging, that, that we have an amazing ability to deceive ourselves. The Bible tells us that our hearts are often cold and calculating. And the Bible tells us that our hearts are sometimes fearful and sometimes our hearts are frustrating. We all have coronary disease spiritually. And what we need is a new heart. What we need is a heart transplant. So I'd like to recommend to you my favourite heart specialist. His name is Dr. Jesus. Let me tell you why I like Dr. Jesus as a heart specialist. He makes house calls. (laughs) He's never lost a patient, not one. He doesn't charge anything. It's all grace. There's no wait. He will see you right now. But the main thing is he specializes in heart transplants. We get a whole new heart. God doesn't just fix up our old one. He gives us a brand new heart. Ezekiel 36, 26 says it like this. I will give you a new heart with a new and right desire and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take out your heart hardened by sin and I'll give you a new heart of love. Remember the verse that said we've got to work out our salvation after what God has worked in. But we can't work out our salvation. We can't strengthen what God has given us until we've got it. We can't work out our salvation until God works it in us. How do we get it? Acts 4.12 says, Salvation can only be found in Jesus alone. In all the world there is no one else whom God has given who can save us. So we start there. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I need a new heart. We all do. Mine has been broken and battered and embittered. It's been fearful and frustrated. It's been cold and calculating sometimes. It's been deceptive. It's been discouraged. I've been fearful. I've been frustrated. And sometimes I've been sick and self-centred. And I need a heart transplant, Lord. I want to become a new person inside. 
So Jesus, I ask you to do your heart surgery on me today. As much as I know how, I ask you to come into my life and work in me and give me both the desire and the ability to do the right thing. Lord, I can't do any of this work out until first you have done the working in. So I'm asking you to save me. I want to put my trust in you. I want to learn to love you. And I want to learn to follow you, Jesus, from this day forward as best I know how. I pray this in your name. Amen. Oh
Thanks so much for tuning in. We just want to say again, Happy Mother's Day. And we just want to say, have a great week and we'll see you next week on Sunday. God bless.